This is the first episode in a series called The History of God. There has been a disconnect between man's history and the Bible until very recently, that is, the last hundred years or so. With the information now available to us, the Bible has become increasingly relevant to man's history. This is a study of the Bible and known history to see how relevant the Bible is to actual discoveries that have been made. Has it been disproved or has it been vindicated? History is the collection of knowledge of past events recorded and stored in libraries around the world. Academic circles have a set of standards that must be met for history to be entered into the written record and accepted by intellectual circles around the world. When a new discovery is made and the facts are gathered and proven to be so, the written record is updated. In records of knowledge, a discovery does not mean that something did not exist before it was discovered. It simply means that something was not recorded in the record. When a lost city is found, or an ancient artifact, especially a written record, it has an effect on the record of history, because knowledge becomes verified or expanded according to the facts established by what has been discovered. Sometimes things can be deleted from the official historical record because a new discovery disproves what was thought to be a fact for many years. When this happens, it can take years for academia to adjust because people who have graduated and are not aware of these new facts may continue on with the disproved facts until they get updated or a new generation of intellectuals matures who accept the new information as fact. Encyclopedias must be updated, and people using encyclopedias must use the updated versions. That is why most encyclopedia are available online today as a subscription, because scholars may have access to the latest information and keep informed in real time of new entries into the information. Before the internet became available, this was a very slow process because few institutions could afford a new library of books every year. Today also, the rate of discovery has increased, the number of archaeological digs has increased, and the methods being used are faster and more efficient. The speed of knowledge has increased to a point today that it is hard to keep up with the flow of new information. The historical record is like a jigsaw puzzle, with no picture to use as a guide. And not only that, many of the pieces are lost, buried, and scattered. As we find records of communication between two cultures, we are able to line up dates with facts more accurately, and information becomes clarified, because specific dates and events are verified by two or more sources. In many of these cases, all we had in the past was the biblical account to tell us of the most ancient empires. Today, we have several sources of information to work with, as well as the biblical record. As more information becomes available, questions get resolved and facts become established. Large areas of the puzzle have been completed and are agreed upon, but it gets very foggy the further into the past we go. In Middle Eastern history, which is the oldest written history available to man, the real fogginess of the past begins approximately 1,300 years before Christ. That is because there was a major event called the Ancient Apocalypse, or the Invasion of the Sea People, which buried the history of several groups of people who were wiped out at that time. We will look at this later. Another catastrophic event took place, the Great Flood of Noah. The authenticated or widely accepted written historical record of man does not go further back than 2000 to 2500 BC at this time. There is speculation on some monolithic sites, large stone structures, which are claimed to be much older, such as 10,000 BC or even older, but these dates cannot be confirmed and are based on speculation. 
In the Western world, the historical record has been built upon, scrutinized, and established more than in any other culture. Archaeology and science have been employed to prove or disprove legend and ancient historical records for over four centuries now, counting from the time that Galileo faced a trial by the Inquisition for believing that the sun is the center of our solar system in 1600 AD. Many view this point as the beginning of modern science and intellectual thought. The Western world measures time using the Gregorian calendar. This is a Christian calendar established by Pope Gregory in 1582 AD. The Gregorian calendar was a modification of the Julian calendar, which was established by the Roman Emperor Julius Caesar in 45 BC. The reason we use BC and AD in our Gregorian date system is because this denotes the scale of years before or after Jesus Christ was born. The acronym AD is from the Latin phrase Anno Domini, which means the year of our Lord. And BC is an acronym which came later and was introduced by historians. It means before Christ. Thus the years BC count backward how many years before Christ was born, and AD counts forward from how many years since Christ was born. The Hebrew calendar, or the Jewish calendar, on the other hand, measures the number of years since creation. This is confirmed by calculating the number of years according to the genealogies recorded in the Bible. Currently, in January 2017, the year, according to the Jewish calendar, is 5,777 years since the creation, which would calculate to the Gregorian date of 3,761 BC. The earliest Chinese dynasty supported by archaeological evidence is the Shang dynasty, which is estimated to have been established in 1600 BC, but only confirmed by archaeological data to have existed as early as 1122 BC. According to Chinese legend, the Shang dynasty was the second Chinese dynasty, with the Zi dynasty being the first. The Zi dynasty is estimated to have existed from 2000 BC to 1600 BC. Therefore, Chinese recorded history reaches back to no more than 2000 BC, after Noah's Ark. Hinduism goes back to the Indus Valley in India at 2600 BC, when the first settlements appear. These are one of the oldest settlements of mankind, along with Mesopotamia, Egypt, and the Hang Ho Valley in China. Hinduism has no founder or date of founding. It is simply the religion of India. Hinduism is rich in mythology, and it is polytheistic. Buddhism is much younger, first appearing at around 550 BC. Over the past 150 years, the historical record has been overturned. Only 400 years ago, Galileo faces charges liable of death for writing that the Earth is not the center of the universe. Only 500 years ago, the scientific record was updated that the Earth is round like a ball and not flat like a pizza. With the end of the Dark Ages, a time where knowledge by the common people was suppressed or forbidden, to the dawn of the intellectual revolution, bringing us modern astronomy and biology and all types of modern science. The historical record has been updated with every discovery made and knowledge has grown. The intellectual revolution was not right about everything, however, not from the start. With the scientific revolution and the dawn of humanism and Darwinism, many of the empires and cities described in the Holy Bible were considered mythical legends and fairy tales by non-Christians, and even by some Christians, until the Middle East was opened up to archaeology in the mid-19th century. 
To the world's amazement, great lost cities of the Bible were discovered buried in the sand. Nineveh, Babylon, Ur, and other great figures of the biblical record were added into the historical record of fact. Sennacherib, Ashurbanipal, Hezekiah, Pontius Pilate, and many others. Indeed, there has been a revolution in biblical thought as well as in secular thought. Biblical scholars understand these ancient empires better than ever before, and as a result, understand the Bible better. As we continue to move forward in our search for truth and fact, and as new discoveries are made, old ideas fall down and new ideas emerge, maturing us all into a greater understanding of this world we live in. Our study begins in the ancient Near East, where the oldest written records of man are found. We will be looking at three basic threads of opinion, or three world views, regarding these records. This will give us a good overview of the evidence available, the opinions out there, and why those opinions exist. These are often opposing opinions, but we wish to know the truth, and in order to determine the truth, we must gather all of the facts and review them before we can make an objective determination. The first of these three opinions we will be looking at is the biblical opinion, not the opinions of people who read the Bible, and there are many, which are often very subjective, but the opinions of the Bible itself. The other two worldviews we will discuss are both opinions of men. The mainstream archaeological opinion of scholars and academics who currently hold the official historical record and an alternative interpretation of the evidence by a large and growing group of followers of a man named Zechariah Sitchin, who wrote a series of books called the Earth Chronicles. This is also called the Ancient Alien View. It is in comparing these three opinions, the biblical opinion, the ancient alien opinion, and the mainstream opinion, that we come to a greater understanding of what we know about the ancient world, and more importantly, what we don't know. When studying secular history and biblical history, we are faced with two opposing opinions, creation versus evolution. When we open the first book of the Bible and read the first sentence, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, we are immediately confronted with a controversial subject, creation versus evolution. Was the world created by an intelligent divine being, or did it just happen as a fact of natural occurrence? Indeed, during the Dark Age of Europe, under the authority of medieval popes and kings, anything but the idea of a divine creator as the sole author of the universe was illegal and punishable by torture or even death. But the authority of the church was challenged in Europe, since Martin Luther posted his 95 theses on the door of the Wittenberg Chapel, claiming that grace is achieved by faith and not penance. He wanted to reform the church, but was met with too much opposition and was excommunicated by the church. He had no choice but to organize an opposing church in Germany, the Lutheran Church. This gave rise to many succeeding Christian churches, all having an updated version of the truth. This is known as the Great Reformation within the Christian Church. It eventually did reform the Vatican itself by the proclamation of Vatican II. In an attempt to maintain relevancy among a Bible-reading populace, with many modernizations but without letting go of past ideas. With the fall of the Holy Roman Empire in Europe, and along with it the fall of the political authority of the popes, there was a double-edged sword. Freedom of thought and freedom of conscience urged on by the great Protestant Reformation in Christianity brought along with it the dawn of rationalism and humanism. These were not new ideas, but they were formerly suppressed and only discussed illegally in secret, 
As the authority of the church over the thoughts and ideas of men was overthrown, these ideas were allowed to flourish along with Protestant Christianity. The idea of a divine creator became to many a symbol of oppressive regimes and unrighteous control over the population, a source of strife and war, as even many today still attest to. These new areas of thought in humanism and rationalism gave rise to a new science called Darwinism. There is currently another revolution underway in the scientific world, just as the invention of the telescope allowed Galileo to gaze at the stars and question the status quo of his time. So today, the invention of the electron microscope allows modern scientists to gaze at the smallest of things, which have never been seen by man before, raising many questions about our own modern status quo. Did you know that a single cell contains the complexity and functionality of any of our greatest cities. It is as complex and functional as any of our greatest factories, all within a tiny microscopic cell. There are as many moving and sophisticated systems working together as there are in a space shuttle. Someone had to think about making this, and then they had to design and manufacture each piece of it and assemble it in a specific way before any part of it has a purpose at all. The platform, the spring, the hammer, the catch, and the hold down bar are the five basic components of this mousetrap. Someone had to conceptualize this device as a functional system and make and assemble each of its parts before any part of it had any function at all. Things like this simply don't happen by chance alone. Not one piece of this mousetrap has any function or purpose without being part of the final assembly. This new concept is, is known in scientific circles as irreducible complexity. This poses a question of how can a functioning single cell in life be formed by chance when it is as complex as a space shuttle. The process of cell reproduction involves several complicated steps involving unraveling, reading and copying a DNA strand which contains millions of bits of information and then rolling it back up, putting it away and taking out the trash and building the copy before reproduction can even begin to occur within the cell. The fact is that cell reproduction is impossible without those very complicated systems in place. This requires intelligent design and assembly. From today forward, there is no such thing as a simple cell, a cell of a living organism, which is as complex as a mega factory or a super city, cannot be produced by electric shock in primordial soup. That method of manufacture couldn't produce even a simple mouse trap, let alone something as complicated and intricate as a living cell. New ideas in scientific circles, such as intelligent design and irreducible complexity, are coming out only in the last decade because of the electron microscope and DNA science, bringing us back once again to questions of origins. I'm not going to attempt to solve these questions today. This is not the intent of this study. I am merely pointing out here that there came to be two different circles of intellect that we must address when we study history and the Bible, evolutionist and creationist. To an evolutionist, the world is billions of years old. To a creationist, it is only 6,000 years old. According to the biblical records, the recorded history of man is only 5,000 years old. We will have to address these two opposing schools of thought in order to piece together our puzzle as we find the pieces to it.
As we get to later history and leave behind the question of origins, the creationist evolutionist arguments become less of a factor because we will be entering into known factual history with the beginning of the first empires. When looking at the Bible record, we will mostly be interested in God's view of the Bible. For example, some people will try to reconcile the seven days of creation with evolution theory by interpreting the seven days of creation as seven ages leading up to the creation of man over an evolutionary scale, thus giving us a creation theory of billions of years. This is not God's view of the Bible. When you look at the record of Holy Scripture, God is not a concept. He is a person with feelings, intellect, and an opinion. The person of God is prevalent throughout the scriptures. In the interest of understanding the intent of the scripture, this is the exact person we are interested in getting to know. The director of all things, the commander of the universe. God gave his commandments to ancient Israel through Moses, and in those commands he states that they must keep the seventh day Sabbath, because God created the world in six days, and on the seventh day he rested. Without questioning God's point of view on the subject, this cannot be interpreted in any other way than seven literal days. This is only one example of many concerning the literal interpretation of the scriptures. There are many interpretations of the scripture out there, and in order not to get bogged down in them, we will generally concentrate our focus on the literal interpretation represented by the person of God himself in the Bible. This was the view of the ancient world, and if we wish to understand the ancient world, this is the view we want to understand. The book of Genesis, the first book in the Bible, reaches back historically further than the human historical written record, while the historical record is what was written down by man and found in archaeology. The dawn of civilization in the same area, the Middle East, begins approximately 1500 years later. While modern scientists and archaeologists work on the presumption that the Bible is a myth, that evolution is more true, in fairness to the scripture and to the God of scripture, I will work on the assumption that the Bible is true when looking at the biblical record and when presenting historical and archaeological evidence, I will present the arguments and theories proposed by the experts with an evolutionist view. In an unbiased attempt to present a broad analysis of history, historians and archaeologists make assumptions about the earliest times based on facts that they know about later times. And this is an acceptable practice. Just as historians use what they know to be fact from later times to make assumptions about earlier times, people of faith also use what they know from later times to make assumptions about more ancient times. When they know that God is real, and from their own experience, and from facts established by later ancient history, then they must assume that the earliest parts of the Genesis must also be true. These earliest legends of the creation and the flood were fully supported by Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of the Christian faith. We cannot reject the book of Genesis without rejecting large sections of the entire Bible and Jesus Christ himself. There was a real creation in seven days, and there was a real flood and Noah's Ark. This is simply based on believing God to be true and later prophets who are proven to be true have attested that the book of Genesis is also true. The book of Genesis also tells us of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It tells us of Joseph in Egypt and God's promise to Israel. These also are inseparable from the creation and flood because they are in the same book. Creationists generally divide the ancient history into pre-flood and post-flood times. We must deal with the fact that there are two basic timelines and we are dealing with in our study. The fixed one presented by the Bible and the evolutionist, which today is billions of years.
for the galaxies and one or two hundred thousand years for mankind. The first nine chapters of Genesis relate to us the story of the creation of the world, the fall of man, and the great flood of Noah. For a biblical scholar, this creates a marker in the historical record between pre-flood and post-flood times. It is also noteworthy that nearly every indigenous culture on earth carries a legend of a great flood. Although these legends may differ in detail, and the fact that the whole earth did experience a flood is a matter of cultural record. Through word of mouth, these legends can change dramatically, and that easily explains differences, while the general notion of a worldwide flood remains at the core of all of them. There are very few, if any, witness accounts of the flood which are, are recorded in writing. The noteworthy thing about the Hebrew records, the Old Testament, this written record has been religiously copied letter by letter for many generations with the specific intent that it not be altered. There is disagreement among scholars as to the age of these books, but the fact has been established by the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls that this record remains unaltered since 100 BC, at a minimum, and that after a long history of religious protection of the scrolls of the record. It is an attestation to the legends of all cultures of man that the oldest and most protected rec written record actually records a flood legend. According to Jewish legend, the account of Genesis was dictated to Moses at approximately 1400 BC by God or an angel as a record of history for the people of Israel. The Sumerian history also is taken mostly from later documents that speak of earlier times. There are some artifacts that back up the history, but the detail of earlier history is also based on the historians of later generations who wrote in legend. We are looking through a foggy glass when we look this far back into history. And we must be careful to check sources when people tell us that there is hard evidence from the earliest times. There is not. We are looking at the history told to us by the earliest historians, and we are comparing legends to legends. It is foggy at best, but it does give us enough factual evidence to make some very general determinations and assumptions. As we move along in history, the closer we get to the present, the more established facts we have at our disposal. In our next episode, we will begin with a brief overview of the pre-flood times from a biblical perspective. Then the Earth Chronicles perspective, or the Ancient Aliens perspective. And finally, from the mainstream scientific perspective. That will start us on our amazing journey through history. In the next episode, I will discuss the biblical worldview of pre-flood times and origins of ancient deities. See you soon.